Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. Uh, my name is Tom Switzer. I'm the Executive Director here at CIS, and it's a great privilege to have you all here today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging just a few distinguished guests uh, from the outset. Uh, first, uh, the former Prime Minister, uh, who's uh, just finished uh, uh, fighting fires around Cooma, uh, Tony Abbott. <laughs> Uh, second, the uh, former Deputy Prime Minister, who of course uh, was a National Party leader and who served on John Howard's Cabinet as Prime Minister uh, with Tony Abbott. That of course is John Anderson. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, not just one, but two former governors of the Reserve Bank. Uh, the Reserve Bank head from 1996 to 2006, Ian McFarlane. And his immediate successor, Glenn Stevens. I'd also like to acknowledge here tonight the presence of uh, the former Secretary to the Commonwealth Treasury and a prominent public servant throughout much of the post-war era, John Stone. <laughs> and as it happens, in the current issue of Quadrant magazine uh, that's published an extract from Andrew Stone's book that we're launching tonight, there happens to be an article by one John Stone and the subject is the decline of the Reserve Bank. <laughs> And in a few months' time, uh, CIS will once again host the current Reserve Bank Governor, Phil Lowe, and I'll be sure to raise with the Governor some of the objections that John Stone puts forward in his article. <laughs> so it's a great privilege to have you all here today. Now, we're gathered here to launch this book by Andrew Stone called Restoring Hope, Practical Policies to Revitalise the Australian Economy. It's published by uh, Quadrant Books. And as head of CIS for the past uh, two years, can I say it's a great honour to host this event. Uh, there was an event uh, done in Melbourne with our friends at the Institute for Public Affairs and the Menzies Research Centre. And it's only fitting that we at CIS do the Sydney launch. After all, for more than four decades, CIS has played a leading role in prosecuting the case for productivity enhancing market oriented economic reforms that have produced or helped produce our 28-year economic expansion. However, all good things come to an end. Uh, the benign economic circumstances have induced, in our judgment at CIS, uh, a level of complacency that is disturbing. Uh, there might be a sudden crisis, perhaps a collapse of economic confidence coming from, say, China's growth, growth slowdown, or the trade and technology war between Beijing and Washington. And Australia faces some important challenges, such as reversing the slip in student performances, uh, putting public finances on a sustainable footing, embarking on further tax reform that sharpens rather than dulls incentives, and reviving productivity, which in turn will revive households purchasing power. Uh, as Andrew Stone makes very clear in this book that we're launching this evening, now is the time to build on our successes as a nation and prepare for the turbulence of years to come by beating the policy reform drum again. Now, this evening, I will introduce one speaker at a time. Uh, they'll have about five to ten minutes to, to give their reflections on the book, and they'll be Paul Kelly and Tony Abbott, and then I'll ask Andrew to make a few brief remarks before I host a discussion with them and try to subject them to some scrutiny before we open it up to Q&A with you. Our first speaker is arguably our nation's most prominent political journalist and historian over the past uh, half century. Uh, he's the editor at large of the Australian newspaper, uh, as well as a former editor in chief of that paper. He's author of many important and influential books, um, The Dismissal, uh, The Hawke Ascendancy, uh, the End of Certainty, as well as the definitive histories of the Keating, Howard, Rudd and Gillard eras. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paul Kelly. Thank you, Tom. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me tonight to discuss Andrew Stone's Restoring Hope. It's a big book, and I like big books. <laughs> They're challenging, and this is a challenging book. It's above all a policy book, from start to end. 
It recognises that Australia is underperforming in economic and social terms, that living standards are faltering, that our policy debate is shallow, too often impracticable and intellectually weak. Andrew Stone believes we need a new agenda for economic reform and a new approach to economic reform. The old agenda is stuck in a ditch. His book is a challenge to both the right and the left and to much conventional economic thinking, if that's not an oxymoron these days. He believes in the power of markets, yet he proposes the most substantial government intervention in the economy for several decades. His message, we can't stay prisoners of ideology. We must look at what works in our current situation. This book deals with complex issues, but it deals with them in a clear, non-jargon, easily understood writing style. Andrew Stone warns of our poor productivity performance, but identifies the weakness in the current debate, the lack of clarity about what exactly we should do to improve productivity. His method has a relentless and welcome logic. He explains the recent background to each policy with, gr with great clarity, identifies the policy problem and offers precise and very detailed prescriptions. If you believe, as I do, that our public debates suffer from useless generalities, impractical sentimentality and posers who are more interested in promoting themselves rather than coherent policy, you will have reason to like this book. But beware, I doubt anybody will agree with all of Andrew Stone's prescriptions. And that's not a weakness, it's the strength of the book. Yes, you won't agree with everything, but it will prompt you to rethink your own views. Let me deal very briefly with four main themes. First, immigration. Stone argues that our current historically high immigration levels are unjustified in economic terms, that they depress wages growth, undermine job opportunities for some people and contribute to rising house prices as well as, as, well as infrastructure pressures. He wants the permanent program cut by 50,000 with cuts of 50% to certain temporary migration schemes, such as foreign university students. The essence of his argument is that while it might have made sense from, nine to, from 2006 in the resources boom to lift the immigration program to extraordinarily elevated levels, when economic conditions change, the program should have been cut appropriately and this has not happened. He predicts multiple dividends if it does happen. Second, higher education reform. Stone assesses both the Pine and Birmingham higher education packages under the coalition and finds both <coughs> wanting. His chief concern is the lack of accountability in our universities and misplaced policy incentives for better outcomes. He says the overwhelming focus of our politicians is inputs into higher education with little interest in the actual education outcomes a flaw he brands as madness. Stone says the existing framework encourages universities to increase student numbers, tolerate debauch standards and promote credentialism. The major reform he wants is to force universities to have skin in the game. He wants student loans to become joint contingent loans to both the student and university so the university has a financial stake and faces, in effect, a financial penalty if it fails to properly equip students. This would infuriate the universities, but leave students <laughs> essentially unaffected, reversing the dire politics of the 2014 Pine Reform Package. Stone's underlying frustration is fear of our politicians and their reluctance to force universities to raise their standards, improve their courses and take greater responsibility for the quality of students they graduate. 
Third, federalism. Andrew Stone believes there are significant potential productivity gains in federal state reforms. He proposes this instead of yet another effort at Commonwealth government taxation reform, suspecting, as I do, that any significant such Commonwealth government taxation reforms will be denied in the Senate amid a counterproductive political brawl. All trouble, no gain. Stone's federal state reform is not that advanced briefly and abandoned by Malcolm Turnbull in 2016. His proposal aims to breathe more life, or at least some life, into competitive federalism by giving the states an incentive to run better economies. There would be no change for taxpayers and no system of double taxation, but states would, re would receive an agreed share of the income tax paid annually by those taxpayers working in their jurisdiction. The more jobs the state created, the more taxpayers paying tax in their state, the more revenue the state would receive. This would be matched by Commonwealth Government withdrawal from certain policy areas to improve public accountability and reduce duplication. Stone seeks here to find a tax proposal that improves efficiency and might attract a degree of political support. Fourth and finally, energy markets. Andrew Stone provides a lengthy overview of how we arrived at our current dismal position. His energy policy prescriptions are the most radical proposals in his book, Witness Chapters 6 and 7. Essentially, he argues government has an insurance responsibility to guarantee provision of power at acceptable prices, just as, for instance, it accepts such an insurance responsibility for the provision of water and medical care. In the current situation, therefore, government should intervene as a baseload electricity provider of last resort to generate supply at constrained prices. That invo this involves a government intervention to secure the rapid construction and operation of several large, new, state-of-the-art coal-fired power stations. The Commonwealth should immediately acquire the Hazelwood and Liddell power stations while announcing attenders for construction on each side of new coal-fired power stations. It should also explore the possibility of a new Commonwealth Government-owned coal-fired power station in Queensland. Stone wants a rebate scheme for electricity retailers who fail to obtain sufficient renewable energy certificates, the aim being to provide price relief to consumers at the end of the day. He wants the government to withdraw from the Paris Climate Change Accord yes. and reduce the Commonwealth's <laughs> policy commitment in energy to two objectives, lower prices and supply reliability, not emissions reduction. These proposals are nothing if not bold. For myself, <laughs> for myself I doubt their political and electoral feasibility. The four examples I have given are merely a sample of this extensive policy-rich and contentious book. It is founded on two assumptions, that business as usual cannot meet Australia's needs, meaning we must act in a far more resolute manner to respond to the challenges only sure to deepen, and secondly, that we need fresh thinking to break out of the straitjacket that bedevils the economic reform debate. Reading this book only reinforces my own view about economic reforms. Any economic reform proposal must be tied to a clear political strategy, and there are only three such strategies. First, executive action that does not require legislation. Secondly, construction of a broad-based political coalition of support for the particular reform proposal, or third, legislation made possible by a coalition negotiated majority in the parliament, as we had, for example, last year with the passage of the income tax cuts. There are many specific proposals in this book, from reserve bank reform to recasting welfare arrangements. I said nobody will endorse all of Andrew Stone's prescriptions, 
but I hope everybody can endorse some of them. Thank you. Well said. Well said. Thanks, Paul. Paul, thank you. Thank you for that. Our next speaker was Prime Minister from 2013 to 2015 and was leader of the Federal Liberal Party from 2009 uh, to 2015. For 25 years, he was the federal member for the seat of Warringah. And he's not just distinguished himself as a prominent writer and author, uh, he's also emerged as a leading surf lifesaver, <laughs> as well as a legendary firefighter. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tony Abbott. <laughs> Good on you, mate. Well, thank you so much, Tom. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, it's wonderful to be here to support Andrew Stone's fine book. Uh, Paul Kelly has spoken eloquently uh, in praise of the book. Uh, I'm here not just to do that, but to speak as eloquently as I can in praise of the man. Uh, because Andrew Stone uh, uh, worked for me for three years in opposition and for two years in government, uh, a better mind is almost impossible to find, but allied to an absolutely first-rate brain is a good heart and a good soul. Uh, a more decent human being would be very hard to find. And even now, I would seldom uh, commit myself to any uh, major intellectual proposition without at least informally running it past Andrew Stone first. <laughs> now, Andrew has addressed uh, the fundamental public policy issue of our time. How do we advance public policy implementation in an era of political constipation? Uh, not only do we have uh, a polarised and increasingly fragmented electorate, uh, but increasingly we see utterly unrealistic demands, um, insistent cries for reform from people who will never specify exactly what kind of reform they want. Uh, demands for policy perfection, uh, followed by uh, denunciation and rejection uh, if people only advance 90% or 80% of what might be a desirable uh, policy direction. So the great thing about this book, as Paul has already outlined, is that it is Andrew's highly sophisticated bid to outline a policy agenda which is both desirable and achievable. And I've got to say that the two principal uh, policy recommendations in this book, uh, first, that the Commonwealth Government uh, assume the responsibility for providing uh, an essential service, namely an affordable and reliable power supply, uh, in my view, is doable because the Commonwealth wholly owns uh, Snowy Hydro. Uh, Snowy Hydro is already in the business of providing baseload power, uh, gas-fired power, uh, as well as hydro power. And if Snowy Hydro is capable of spending uh, many billions of dollars on so-called Snowy 2.0, uh, certainly uh, it's capable of spending a somewhat lesser amount on something like Hazelwood uh, 2.0, and that is something that the federal government could bring about simply by ordering the company to do so. Uh, the other policy area which is wholly within the competence of the Commonwealth and which uh, can be adjusted substantially without further legislation uh, is immigration. Now, there's absolutely no doubt uh, that record levels of immigration uh, sustained for more than a decade have put substantial downward pressure on wages, substantial upward pressure on housing prices, and at the same time are making ordinary Australians, uh, newcomers and old timers alike, our lives more difficult through the dreadful congestion that we now find uh, on our roads and in our public transport. Um, of course, uh, building baseload power, um, substantially reducing immigration, 
and in particular uh, cutting back on the ability of business and universities uh, to effectively inflate the numbers without reference to government uh, would be contentious. It would be unpopular uh, with uh, powerful and influential lobby groups. Uh, it would almost certainly be opposed by a Labor Party in thrall to the Green Left. And yet the business of politics uh, is not to do what is easy. The business of politics is to do what is in the long term best interests of the country. There is nothing wrong with having a fight. The problem is only if it's a fight you can't win. Now I don't believe that uh, any serious government or serious political movement should fight with everyone about everything all the time. But it is important to address the problems that are most bedeviling our country. And if you ask ourselves what are the issues of most anxiety to normal Australians, uh, their wages are flat, their cost of living is getting uh, higher, they worry about their kids' job prospects and they wonder whether our country uh, in several decades time will have the same decencies and the same cohesion which, thank God, we enjoy currently. And the sorts of proposals that Andrew is talking about uh, are designed to address those issues. Now, um, there's much else in this book and Paul has certainly uh, addressed that uh, very well. I don't propose to further elaborate. Um, unsurprisingly, there's not much in the book that I would disagree with. Uh, <laughs> perhaps one thing that uh, I was less enthusiastic about uh, was the proposal for a kind of lifetime account uh, uh, against which uh, people needing unemployment uh, benefits, etc., uh, could draw down against. Um, in my own view, uh, the Howard government had it right uh, when it tried to ensure that the something for nothing culture was uh, was uh, was eroded uh, through uh, seeking to force all longer term relatively young able-bodied unemployed uh, to do work for the dole. I think that frankly is more practical than these lifetime accounts that Andrew talks about. Nevertheless, what we need is more of our best brains thinking constructively about what might be done to improve things rather than simply lamenting the state that we're in. In the end, uh, sensible centre-right government is not ideological at all. Uh, it is practical. Yes, it's pragmatism based on values but it is, above all else, getting things done. Things that need to be done for the long-term benefit of our country. Um, back in 2013, uh, the mantra was, uh, uh, we'll scrap the big new taxes, we'll stop the boats, we'll build the infrastructure of the 21st century, uh, and we'll get the budget back under control. It was Andrew Stone's practical wisdom uh, that helped to formulate that very practical and sensible uh, policy uh, prescription. And uh, while uh, we struggled, as all of you know, uh, with budget repair, uh, it is greatly to the credit of the Morrison government that finally, finally, uh, a surplus uh, is either within grasp uh, or it is um, about it has actually been grasped. I suppose we'll find out soon enough what the situation is. Of course, the one issue that Andrew does not address in this book is how do we ungum our political system? I mean, how do we ensure uh, that despite everything, the states, um, uh, the Senate, um, a rancorous public culture. How do we get back to a situation 
where governments of the centre-right, as opposed to governments of the centre-left, uh, can get what they have taken to an election uh, sensibly implemented. Uh, it's a very big question, Andrew. You've told us what you think we can do given the system as it is. Perhaps uh, a suitable second book might be <laughs> how we can make some sensible changes to the system itself. <clears throat> Tony, thank you for that. And uh, indeed, we'll raise some of those issues in our conversation. Uh, Andrew Stone, as Tony mentioned, uh, was a senior advisor to Tony as both opposition leader and as prime minister. And he's also a former senior economist at both the Commonwealth Treasury and the Reserve Bank of Australia. The book is called Restoring Hope, uh, Practical Policies to Revitalise the Australian, Australian Economy. It's published by Quadrant Books. Copies are available uh, for uh, purchase and, of course, signature. In the meantime, please welcome Andrew Stone. Thanks, Tom. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you very much indeed to the CIS for hosting uh, this event tonight. Uh, let me begin just, uh, I only plan to speak briefly, let me just begin with a number of thanks. First of all, thanks to you as the audience for turning up. It's tremendous to see such a large turnout. I, I'm uh, surprised and gratified that so many people have been happy to come out on a, on a Tuesday only just after the Australia Day holiday. Uh, can I also say a particular thank you to Keith Winchuttle, whom I believe is here. Uh, and uh, as head of Quadrant Books, ah yes, there, Keith, great to see you. I, I want to particularly thank Keith for his assistance in actually bringing this book to fruition, to, the, to I think the very handsome volume that he has produced. It really was a Herculean effort by him uh, as I tried to navigate the difficult task of getting a manuscript into a finally published volume. Uh, it was a tremendous thing to be put in touch with Keith and for him then to be able to, to turn that into this finished volume. Um, <laughs> It was an effort where actually, I believe accurately, uh, most other public publishers said that there was no possibility whatsoever of achieving it within the deadline that he actually achieved. So thank you, Keith. Uh, can I also, um, on a personal note, say a particular thanks to, uh, well, to my wife and family for their forbearance while I was preparing uh, this book over such a long period, but also particularly to my mum and dad uh, who are here tonight, uh, not only for their assistance and their constant support, uh, but in particular in relation to this book, for their heroic efforts also in helping it to come to fruition. Uh, that includes the fact that they diligently read uh, almost 600 page printer proofs in the space of 24 hours. Uh, and it's quite something to have parents who are happy to do that and who indeed discover. Uh, uh, it's genuinely a blessing to have parents who will, and who, who will discover a, a typo on page 542 <laughs> of the book that I had missed every time in the half dozen times that I had read it. Um, can I say a particular thanks to Tom Switzer uh, and the CIS team, as I said earlier, for helping to host this event tonight and also to the Institute for Public Affairs and Nick Hater and the Menzies Research Centre for their assistance in, in uh, helping with a launch in Melbourne and hopefully with a further launch of this book in, in Canberra in a few weeks' time. I'm very grateful for that. I'm also very grateful to John Anderson in particular and also his team, especially Nick and Nikki, who are also here tonight, uh, for their encouragement of this work because that again was a, was a great help to me as I was going along to discover that there might actually be some people interested in this material, uh, but also for their assistance with putting together events uh, like tonight's. Uh, and also let me say particular thanks to both Paul Kelly and Tony Abbott for their very generous and very insightful comments tonight. And I'm sure we'll be discussing a number of the points that they've, they've made, but I'm um, uh, particularly um, grateful for their, for their kind and as I say, I think particularly insightful comments. I don't wish to say particularly much about the book. I'll leave that to the, to the discussion. But let me just touch on briefly one point. Uh, as Tom mentioned, actually, in his very, very beginning introductory remarks, uh, a point that I make in this book is that I think there are four key problems with the public policy debate that Australia's had for the past dozen years and that stand in stark contrast to the sort of public policy debate that we had about economic issues in the 1980s and the 1990s. Very briefly, they are the shallowness of the debate the policy incoherence, uh, whether that's from genuine intellectual incoherence on the part of the participants or whether just because so much policy unfortunately, unfortunately these days is made in a piecemeal fashion so that a small people are addressing their particular bailiwick and they propose policies here but they're unaware that the left hand as it were doesn't know what the right hand is doing and you end up with mutually contradictory policies. 
Uh, also, the, uh, there's a core problem of the uh, production of vague and distant promises in, in place of concrete policies. I was um, particularly pleased that it appealed to Paul, that, as he was saying, that I, I, am, I have no time for all the useless generalities, poseurs and so forth, as he described them, who seem to populate much of the public policy, far too much of the public policy debate. Might I also just say in, in reference to something Tony said, he mentioned that at the 2013 election, uh, he had his various mantras, ax the tax, stop the boats and so forth. And this was a source of much uh, abuse and much criticism by uh, oh, the bien pensants and so forth, the, the ABC and others about uh, you know, these, these pointless four word slogans, three word slogans and so forth. But the key point I think that's worth bearing in mind about phrases like axe the tax or stop the boats is that they are very specific concrete policy commitments which is not possible to wriggle out of. After three years you can tell was the tax axed or was it not axed? Were the boats stopped or were they not stopped? And that is so infinitely preferable to what has become so common in the last 12 years unfortunately otherwise which is the resort to these vague and distant promises about let's, wh what are we going to do about emissions? We'll make a pledge about emissions in 2050. 2050 you know, 40 years, more than 40 years away when Kevin Rudd first started making those sort of promises, or just to be bipartisan about it, uh, in the 2016-17 uh, election, or, sorry, 2016 election, we had the coalition's commitment to company tax cuts that would only become fully effective in 2026-27, which is to say, after the election, after the election, after the election, after the one we were about to have. And I think the Australian people rightly think that commitments of, or pledges of that sort are not to be taken seriously. So that's one of the core problems, I think, with current debate. And finally, as both Paul and, and Tony noted, the there's the general concern about the practicality of proposals. So my hope with this book, uh, whether one agrees with the policy prescriptions or not, has been to try to avoid those four failings so as to offer a core foundation, a solid foundation for serious economic debate for supporters and opponents alike, at least to give you something that everybody can get their teeth into and say specifically what they think are the, are the good points or bad points of. I've tried to combine that with, with a, an attempt to be innovative in tackling various long-standing issues of policy gridlock wherever I can be, so um, in particular uh, on federal state relations, on higher education reform, uh, in a number of other areas, even in relation to energy policy, and we may discuss that later on. I've tried to come up with some ideas which I think are ways of trying to get around impasses and gridlock in the public policy debate. Uh, and my hope is that the book might at least con contribute, therefore, to reigniting a, a proper and productive policy debate. Uh, with like and with your support, it will do so, and I look forward to being part of that process, uh, including under the auspices of, uh, of organisations like the CAS that have long been at the forefront of trying to lift the quality and seriousness of Australia's public policy debate. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> I'd like to call on the uh, panel to the stage, uh, Andrew Stone, Tony Abbott and Paul Kelly. And I should stress uh, from the outset that although CIS uh, agrees with uh, much of what Andrew has said in his book, we at CIS don't like echo chambers. <laughs> So I'm going to try to subject our guests here to some scrutiny, and if I fail in that task, I hope you'll help me in the Q&A session. Um, Andrew, you started uh, by mentioning something you say in your book, which is uh, calling out the, quote, shallowness, lack of intellectual coherence, impracticality, and the resort to commitments off in the never-never as a substitute for concrete policies of current policymaking. Now, given all of that, and given your thesis is pretty far-reaching, and given the polarisation and what some might say the political dysfunction in Canberra, how plausible is it that we could sell your economic reform agenda uh, in Canberra? Well, I, I have endeavoured as much as possible to make it that I believe it is possible to sell that. I, you know, on, in some instances, it's because I believe the politics support it, uh, but it would be difficult perhaps <coughs> to get through things through the Senate. Um, but in some cases, that that's unnecessary. So, for example, the proposals in relation to immigration, I think, are a particularly um, easy one that, that a coalition government could pick up, mm -hmm. or indeed, seats of a Labor government could pick up, but I don't think it's, it's likely that they would, because they are within the power of the government simply to make changes. They don't yeah. require parliamentary authorisation. But there are other instances where, uh, and uh, Paul mentioned this, for example, the higher education reforms. Um, I propose those because although um, the coalitions had two goes at higher education reform and <coughs> Uh, and both packages had some things to recommend them, but also a lot of failings, and on both occasions have, have largely failed, unfortunately. Uh, nevertheless, the point is, I think, that there is a way through that would actually produce a much better reform package than either of those packages, but that also would be fundamentally much more politically achievable. And Paul mentioned this point specifically, for example, in relation to my idea of 
joint higher education um, loan program loans, that I think that's a way in which you can completely flip the politics from what applied previously. So instead of having a situation where you're trying to argue for something that 40 vice chancellors like, mm. but that hundreds of thousands of students dislike, you can simultaneously come up with something that is much better policy and yet would have hundreds of thousands of students liking it, even though the 40-odd vice-chancellors would hate it. Do you need a crisis to help sell your agenda? I think of the 1980s when Bob Hawke and Paul Keating came to power in the mid-1980s. You had the currency crisis, the balance of payments crisis, uh, and you had the recession in the early 80s. Uh, and uh, Hawke and Keating used that crisis as a way of kick-starting the economic reform agenda, lest Australia become a banana republic. Yeah. Likewise, when uh, Howard and Costello came to power in 96, it was dealing with the aftermath of the recession we had to have. Do we need an economic crisis to help sell these ideas in Canberra? Uh, it's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure that we, we do. Uh, and I'm not even completely sure, I suppose, that I think a crisis would necessarily, in the current circumstances, advance that. In fact, I know I've heard Paul himself speak, possibly even at a CIS event, I think, about the risk that, in fact, if we had a crisis, you might, in fact, get a, a flight to much worse policy. So there's always that uh, risk. Um, but more generally, I mean, I think the, the broader point is what is necessary to get good reform? Um, there are a whole series, what, from my limited time, looking from the inside uh, and my time more generally in public policy, I'd say you realise there are a series of things that need to align. Part of that is the production of good, actually innovative policy ideas that stand some chance of passing muster. And that's one of the things I think, where, mm. for example, there's less of that coming out of the public service now than it would be ideal to have and so forth. There are various other factors. But one of the key things, uh, and which I think is, in other words, was less crisis related in those times, is you need people just to have the guts to prosecute the case. Mm. And that's one of the rarest things I think you'll find. And that's what I think I, I'd argue um, Tony and also, to give him credit, Joe Hockey yeah. in the 2014 15 budget well, were prepared to have a go. Well, on that note, uh, Tony, you were recently in Washington to, among other things, farewell Joe Hockey as our ambassador in Washington. And you claim that the 24 bud 2014 budget that Andrew just mentioned was the last to attempt serious economic reform. Many of your critics say you failed because you were blocked in the Senate by the Greens and the Labor Party. And also, uh, what distinguishes this period from, say, the Hawke-Keating-Howard-Costello era is that uh, polarising social media, that whenever, you put, whenever a politician or a policymaker puts forward an idea, it gets slammed down. How difficult is it now to embark on serious reform? Well, it's very difficult to embark on serious reform if you require legislation because uh, um, there is a real problem in the Senate, uh, a cultural problem uh, and a structural problem. Uh, the cultural problem is that the Senate no longer sees itself as essentially a House of Review. Uh, it sees itself as a House with an equal mandate to the House of Representatives. And the structural problem is that when we increase the size of the Senate from um, uh, uh, six senators uh, per half, s uh, from five senators per half senate election to six senators per state per half senate election, uh, we meant that uh, we, we, we ensured that instead of getting three out of five with about 48% of the vote, you needed 58% of the vote to get four out of six. Now, you could get three out of five. Uh, but it's almost impossible to get four out of six. The only time you've got four out of six since the Senate was expanded in 84 was in 2004 when we fluked four coalition Senate seats in Queensland. And that's the only time mm. a centre-right government, indeed any government, has had a majority in its own right in the Senate. Centre-left governments that want to increase spending, uh, increase regulation and increase taxes on the so-called rich, they don't have any trouble getting a crossbench support. Yes. But centre-right governments that want to reduce taxes on our most productive people, that want to reduce regulation uh, and that want to reduce spending find it incredibly difficult without a majority in their own right. Yes, but in fairness, Senate that support. 2014 budget, you and Joe Hockey did support Labor's policies on the NDIS and you offered and you put forward and implemented a more generous paid maternity leave scheme than Julia Gillard even contemplated. Well, That's big government, Tony. Oh, Tom, please. Um, the, the, Tom, the, keep the, 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 look, the, the NDIS um, was a Labor Party a proposal that uh, we 
didn't oppose at the time uh, for, I think, all sorts of uh, good reasons. Um, the paid parental leave scheme, uh, I believe, is an idea whose time will eventually come. Uh, but it was the wrong scheme at the wrong time, mm -hmm. given the fiscal circumstances that we faced when we came into government. But uh, if I may say so, um, uh, while I'm all in favour of stay-at-home mums, if that's their choice, uh, I do think that a properly conservative government uh, acknowledging that uh, having a family is one of the most wonderful things that anyone can do would make it easier uh, for women in the workforce to have more kids. And that's a real problem in every Western country. Middle class women do not have enough kids. Um, <laughs> women in the welfare system have lots of kids. Yeah. Um, if, uh, if you're very wealthy, uh, you can afford to have as many kids as you want. <laughs> but if you are earning somewhere between uh, maybe 80,000 and 200,000 bucks a year, uh, and you've got to take a long yeah. period of time out of the workforce, um, all too often the choice is not to do it. And I think that's a real problem. Now, back to economics, do you country. abolish, um, do you regret uh, abolishing the debt ceiling? Um, that, in retrospect, was a mistake. Uh, it was a mistake. You haven't um, said that publicly, though, have you? Ever? I think I have. I yeah? think I said right. it in a wonderful piece for Quadrant. Oh, right. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, given that Quadrant have published Andrew's book, I think we can advertise Quadrant okay. here today. I wrote three splendid essays for Quadrant in <laughs> 2016, right. and okay. in one of them I think I said that was a mistake. Okay, let's bring in Paul Kelly here, because ceiling. Paul, in your writings and your books, uh, you've identified a serious, what you call a serious political crisis in Canberra. You say Australia's mm. political culture is, quote, noisy, egotistical, destructive and consumed by self-interest. Yeah. So how on earth can any government implement uh, a long-term structural reform agenda, the likes of which Andrew Stone's proposed? Uh, well, that's a complex and tricky question. Let me just make a couple of observations about that, Tom. <clears throat> the May uh, 2019 election needs to be focused on and not forgotten about. Now, I know a lot of people on the centre-right might criticise the agenda Scott Morrison took to that election. But he won, and he won against uh, the trend in many ways, the trend over the previous three years, which had shown that there was likely to be a change of government. The polls indicating that Labor uh, had a fairly entrenched lead over the government. And what I think that result suggested was that people were sceptical about taxation increases, particularly the sort of taxation increases proposed by Labor, that they were sceptical about big new spending announcements, that they were dubious about the value of uh, these new spending announcements, and that while Labor won votes on its climate change policy, had nonetheless lost the election, and I think that there was a degree of reservation about Labor's climate change policy as well. So I think if one's looking at this from the position of the centre-right, there is a lot of heart to be taken uh, from uh, that 2019 election. In particular, in particular, what it demonstrated was that a majority of the people uh, rejected uh, the progressive social and economic agenda being proposed by Labor when Labor expected to win. And the takeout, the takeout from that was that at the end of the day, the country was more cautious and more skeptical of a progressive agenda than many people believed. So I think that needs to be built upon, not forgotten about, not forgotten about. Uh, and it's very important, I think, for the current government to be alert to the reasons why it won, and not to walk away from that framework too quickly. Uh, the, second, the second point that I would make is that um, there are really significant problems getting up policy reform. And so 
centre-right governments need to be more astute, both tactically and strategically. I said at the end of my comments that if you're proposing an economic reform, you've got to link it to a political strategy. Don't mount it unless there's a political strategy to go with it, and I identified what I think are the three political strategies. The related point I'd make is that I think coalition governments have not been good at selling general based ideas. Uh, like, if you think there's a problem with universities, then start to say it. Start to say it ahead of enunciating the policy because there's, there's a sense in the community that yes, there is a problem with universities. So you sort of build up, you build up support in terms of the general themes, whether we're talking now about spending or universities or welfare or tax or even climate change. And I think that the, the centre-right of politics, the coalition side of politics, has got to understand the cultural debate a lot better and be more effective at an earlier stage in selling general ideas. We'll get to climate and energy very soon, but following on from that, Paul, uh, and, and this is an example of your very point, uh, shortly after Malcolm Turnbull became Prime Minister, he put forward the idea of increasing the GST to 15% in exchange for growth-friendly income tax cuts. And as, within, I think, weeks of putting forward the idea, he went to water and he disbanded the idea. That's a classic case of what you're talking about, right? Well, it's a perfect case of what I'm talking about, and there's no point, if you're a Prime Minister or Treasurer, in starting to push an idea when it's not thought through and it's not formed, and then suddenly finding that there's a lot more policy defects and political resistance to what you're floating. I mean, that's just absurd. So I think this was yeah. a particularly good example of the wrong way to proceed with economic reform. Might I say also that um, I don't think proposing uh, an extension of the GST at that particular point in time was a very sound idea at all, um, because I don't think I don't think there's sufficient broadly based support for that. I happen to think the idea is a good idea. Many people would not subscribe to that, uh, but apart from that, I just don't think there was a sufficient base of political support for such an idea at that time. OK, moving on to energy and climate. Andrew, in your book, you, and you mentioned it in your remarks uh, briefly, that you propose uh, the construction of new state-of-the-art coal power stations in Hazelwood and Liddell and a potential third power station in Queensland uh, to help restore the economy's low energy cost advantage. Your critics would say that the recent bushfires, the devastating bushfires, are the, these, these are their words, the historic shock uh, that will eventually set Australia on decarbonising our economy. And they'll point out that big investors are already highlighting their exit from coal. Your response? Uh, well, I'd say, first of all, of course they will say that <coughs> uh, because they're trying to um, uh, stampede people into a position. Uh, so I, I'm not at all surprised that people... But it is already them. happening, though, isn't it? Oh, so let me come to the second point. The okay, first point sure. is the argument that somehow we all ought to get out of the way and get on board the climate change train because, because of the bushfires. It doesn't surprise me at all that people are trying to stampede us in that direction. Mm. Uh, but I think one should simply ignore that. Um, to the broader point, though, that you make, that there are lots of private companies getting out of coal and, and the point that's always made, ah, well, you see... Renewables must be the way to go because no private company will build a coal-fired power station. My response is simple. If you look at how the regulatory terrain has developed over the last 20 years, uh, since the formation of the NEM and then the introduction of the Renewable Energy Target and all the state-based schemes and so forth, it's no surprise at all that private companies won't build because you have created a regulatory monstrosity that is massively skewed towards renewables. So it is absurd to say when you have the combination of that and the legal warfare and sovereign risk that's been deliberately built into the mm. system by the behaviour of various governments, especially the Labour Party and the Greens, to then turn round and you know, require some, uh, you know, some nerve, I suppose, you've got to admire them for that, but to turn around and then say, ah, but this goes to show renewables must be a market solution because no one will build a coal-fired power station. That makes no sense. Now, you, you know, it certainly doesn't show that coal-fired power is not the, the way to go. What it does tell you, however, is that until you can completely undo all that regulatory terrain, and that's extremely difficult to do. I do give one proposal which I think gives an indirect way of effectively repealing the RET without actually repealing the RET, but leave that aside for the moment. Um, <coughs> it's, you still, um, 
what it says is that you need to think, how do we go about achieving the desirable policy outcome if we can't count on the private sector to do it, both for those reasons and also because both the retail and generation sectors of the energy uh, market have become these vertically inter integrated oligopolies that are very much interested in looking after themselves and it's not a properly functioning market, as the ACCC has said. The proper solution is to say, this is an in instance where the nature of the market justifies Commonwealth intervention. So the Commonwealth steps in, uses its balance sheet to build coal-fired power stations and solves the problem. And we effectively go back to the status quo ante that worked actually perfectly fine for 40 years after the Second World War, where the states all did this individually. Yeah. In fact, I'd rather go back to the states, but since we've already got the national energy market, electricity market on the East Coast, and it would be more difficult to unpick that, it's easier now for the Commonwealth. What about if big uh, trading partners, and this is a point that the former Labor Minister Craig Emerson makes in today's financial review, what if big trading partners uh, put in place a carbon border tax on Australian exports? Wouldn't that ramp up the costs of inaction, as the critics say? But why would China do that? Because China's <laughs> building so many new coal-fired power Well, that's, that's, I mean, I'm not Craig Emerson here, but he would say <laughs> that, that um, notwithstanding China's efforts to chug along the smoky path to prosperity, they are making yeah. investments in this, yeah. oh, in well, renewable energy. Again, I, I, I <coughs> take the argument that is made that we will make ourselves supposedly this international pariah if we don't mm. go along with this. I simply don't give them much credence. Mm. And in fact, I think the idea that um, you know, th there was some possibility that this sort of thing might have occurred 10 years ago when we were living more, if from a geopolitical sense, more in this sort of world where we could all pretend that climate change really was this yeah. big issue, even though plainly, in my view, it wasn't. Um, but these days, with the rise of China and with what's going on in the European Union, we are actually back into a much more um, dangerous and difficult geopolitical situation than we were 10 years ago. And we don't have, I, I think most countries realise, they, they don't have the luxury of pretending sure. to, alien, to talk about these things and potentially alienate an important country like Australia by threatening to do these sorts of things and with all the ramifications that that would have. So I think people will talk big and the yeah. United Nations will talk big about this, but I don't actually seriously countenance the idea that anything would happen. And let's happen. remember, we, the, the, the Paris Climate Accord was not legally binding, enforceable legally or, binding. Or, or verifiable. And now we're going to play some audio very yeah. soon, so get ready for that. But to preempt that, Tony, uh, in your concession speech uh, last mm -hmm. May, you made uh, uh, a very important remarks where you talked about how in working seats, conservatives were doing well, whereas in wealthy seats, conservatives were doing it tough and the green left was doing a lot better. And you then made the point where climate change is a moral issue, we liberals do it tough, but where climate change is an economic issue, we do very well. Let's get your reaction to something your uh, successor, Malcolm Turnbull, told the BBC just last week. The, the right and the Liberal Party essentially operate like terrorists. Now, <laughs> I'm not suggesting that they use guns and bombs or anything like that. But their approach is one of intimidation. And they basically say uh, to the rest of the party, and if you don't do what we want, we will blow the show up. Malcolm Turnbull then went on to say on the BBC. This proposition that it's a left-right issue, which is what you'd hear in Australia, if you go to any of the right-wing think tanks or you read the Murdoch press, it's just full of climate denialism and, and, and uh, obfuscation. It is designed to deflect from the real objective, which has to be to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. That's uh, former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull on the BBC, Tony Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, I'm not in the business of being critical of the Liberal Party. You're not, you're not a miserable ghost. <laughs> and, and, and look, while I have to concede that no political party is perfect and no government is mistake-free, even my own, uh, I, I don't think it is fair uh, to characterise the Liberal Party in the way that we've just heard. And look, um, in the end, uh, it is the duty of all governments, uh, it's certainly the aspiration of sensible centre-right governments to ensure that you've got affordable and reliable power. Mm. And yes, uh, as far as possible, we should try to reduce emissions because as far as possible, we should rest lightly on the planet, of which we have only one. But if it came to a choice between uh, reducing emissions uh, and keeping power affordable and reliable, mm. well, I'd go with affordability and reliability every day. And the other point to remember, uh, uh, as Andrew uh, is only too well aware, 
new coal-fired power stations produce 30 to 40 per cent less emissions than the current fleet Okay, but it's not Australia. just Turnbull and The Guardian and the ABC and the Sydney Morning Herald who are making these arguments. This is from the Financial Review's editorials, mm -hmm. quote, Australian summers appear to be getting hotter and perhaps drier. Emissions from fossil fuels are now warming up the Earth's atmosphere in potentially costly ways. A broad-based carbon tax would harness the invisible hand of the marketplace to reduce the negative externality of emissions at least cost. The money raised could be handed back to taxpayers. Now, that's a financial review edited by Michael Stutchbury. Mm -hmm. Tony Abbott. Well, I respectfully disagree with Michael, and I respectfully disagree with his uh, editorial. And I think one of the reasons why centre-right governments uh, succeed is because we aren't afraid of having a fight on important issues about cost of living and important <coughs> issues about respect for our country. Uh, and frankly, again, if it was a choice between the United Nations and Australia, I'd put our country yeah. first. Every Let me time. bring in Paul Kelly here because Paul has... Uh, yeah. Paul, Paul, you've covered the politics of climate change very closely in this country for more than 15 years now. How do you account for this? Australia meets its Kyoto, is on track to meet its Paris climate targets. According to the Financial Review, Australia has led the world in taking up wind and rooftop solar power. And we have emerged, this is the Financial Review, as the world's biggest exporter of liquefied natural gas. And the transition to gas has helped reduce global carbon emissions and kept the air cleaner over the big cities. So in light of all that, how do you account for the fact that coalition governments generally are all too often accused of failing to act on climate change, given that record? Well, Australia is a fossil fuel economy. Uh, and so if you look at Australia's performance, I think you've really got to compare us to other rich industrialised um, uh, energy exporting, commodity exporting countries, such as South Africa, uh, Canada, New Zealand. <coughs> and if you look at how we're we going <coughs> in terms of emissions and climate change compared to those countries, well, you've got a very different picture compared to uh, comparing us to the Netherlands or something like that. So the key thing here is the comparisons and the contrast. I think this is a particularly important point. Um, and obviously we have high per capita emissions because we're a fossil fuel economy. Um, but you've also got to look at um, where the major emitters are. We are a 1.3% uh, emissions economy. What this means is that uh, by having more ambitious targets, we can't really do anything that alters um, uh, greenhouse gases in the environment. So I actually think the Australian public is pretty much aware of this point. Um, and I think it's something that the coalition needs to emphasise a lot more. Because essentially, essentially, <coughs> the argument we've seen over summer, and I've written about this for tomorrow's paper, is that the fires were caused by climate change. We've therefore got to do something about climate change. But the fact of the matter is that Australia can't uh, change the global environment. Uh, so if you actually think the problem is about climate change, Australia can't do much about it. The problem can be solved by action from the major emitters, if you believe in that argument. I think uh, the other point I would make, though, is that um, I think that the coalition has got to be much more effective at presenting its case on climate change. And... I accept as a truism what Tony says, that when climate change is a moral debate, the left and the progressives win. When it's an economic debate, the centre-right win. That's certainly true. But I don't think that can suffice in terms of a political and ideological position for the centre-right. The centre-right has got to be able to effectively attack the moral arguments mounted by the progressives. And one of the major attacks is the point that I just made. That is, uh, people saying, well, we have to do more in this country to solve a global problem, a global problem created by the major emitters, a problem that we can't actually do much to solve anyway. So that is a practical attack 
on the moral foundations being mounted by the progressives when it comes to climate change. And I should stress that in a fortnight's time, that is on February 11, here in Sydney in this room, we'll be hosting uh, the Danish environmentalist uh, Bjorn Lomborg. Uh, tickets are still available for that. Uh, and also in Canberra on February 10. Lomborg, of course, accepts the science. He just questions some of the mitigation policies. But no one here rejects science, well, that's, mate. No. Uh, Okay, but there, point, there are differing views uh, when it comes right. to the science. Yes, here. but the, the, well, there were different views. But he 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 does accept the more uh, catastrophic accounts. Except he says that governments can only do so much, and they'd be better off via cost-benefit analysis of investing in things like malaria and poverty. Anyway, that's Bjorn Lomborg here in a couple of weeks' time. Let's move on to uh, immigration, uh, Andrew, because we haven't talked about that yet. You uh, identify a looming demographic crisis that is significant population ageing over coming decades, and yet you support slashing immigration from, I think it's 160,000 to about 110,000. That's the annual intake. But don't immigrants tend to be young, which helps slow ageing? Uh, they do tend to be young. Yes, most immigrants actually are in their 20s and 30s, uh, and so significantly the uh, rapid influx of immigrants tends temporarily, temporarily. to lower the, uh, the age ratio of the population. However, the clear finding uh, of the demographers uh, and interestingly, in some are areas of economics, you hear about modelers and the modelers will tell you this or that about energy and umpteen other things. Um, having had spent a considerable part of my career um, dealing with economic modeling, I am inclined to largely discount everything that economic modelers tell you. <laughs> <laughs> with the, uh, and sorry, I should, I should qualify that. When you get good modeling, you can still learn lots of interesting things about them. So if you get a good model like Brian Fisher, as the modeling that he produced before the last election, it, it can be informative. But the point estimates, all those sorts of things that you should be taken with an enormous grain of salt because very often the models are large and complicated and what you discover is that a parameter has been built in deep down in the bowels of the model to produce the outcome you first wanted, you first thought of. Um, the one caveat to that, however, is demographic modelling where the point is the, the processes that go on are very slow moving and very predictable. So um, actually long term demographic modelling is the one area where uh, modelers can provide you with very good insights about what's going to happen. And the interesting point is it's been known for several decades, notwithstanding the fact that most of the policy um, uh, clique in Canberra, the public servants and the politicians would tell you otherwise, but it's been well established for decades now that in the long run, rapid immigration, or, albeit that they tend to be younger than the general population, does not significantly affect population ageing. In fact, I include uh, a quote in my book, which if you'll forgive me quoting it briefly, I, I liked it so much that I've included it twice in the book at two different points. Uh, this is from a noted demographer, Peter MacDonald, 20 years ago in a, in a study prepared for the immigration department. ANU, right? Yeah, that's right, um, mm. and now Melbourne University, I think. So he says, levels of annual net immigration above 80,000 become increasingly ineffective and inefficient in the retardation of ageing. Those who wish to argue for a higher level of immigration must base their argument on the benefits of a larger population, not upon the illusory younging power of high immigration. And he, he actually quantifies that with a, what he calls an efficiency index, which shows that in terms of the, the capacity to reduce the share of the population over 65, relative to how, many, how much you have to increase the, the population by at, a, at a, say, a 50 or, or 100 year horizon, if you look at a 100 year horizon, which is the right sort of time frame to look at these things on, an increase from 200 to 250,000 in net overseas migration, which is sort of what we've seen, you know, we're running about 250,000 now, um, that, that second 50,000 is, is only one seventh as effective in reducing ageing as the first 50,000 of the immigration program. So the truth is, Two points here. Before the massive increase in immigration that occurred late in the Howard government, and that has been maintained since, it was reduced slightly under, you know, a little bit under Tony, but then unfortunately has gone straight back up again. Prior to that, Australia ran an extremely rapid immigration program by international standards. Our immigration program, when, when our program averaged about 100,000 a year, was faster than every other OECD country with two exceptions, Israel, over the preceding 25 years. The two exceptions were Israel, because of a massive influx of Jews from Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the other uh, um, counterexample is Liechtenstein, which has a population of less than half a million. So a whole lot of tax avoiders were moving into <laughs> Liechtenstein. Other than that, Australia already had the fastest immigration program in per capita terms of any uh, OECD country. And yet we doubled that. And it, we're, we're constantly told, oh, we need to do this because of ageing, or we need to do this because of economic benefits or whatever. But the, the statistics and the modelling simply do not bear out those arguments. OK, but Adam Crichton, who I think is in the audience here this evening, he's an economics writer yep. at The Australian. He yep. used to work here at CIS, and I think he worked for you briefly, yep. Tony. He makes the point that without our net overseas migration of, I think the figure was 250,000 yeah, a year, if without that, the economy would almost certainly be in a recession. Tony. 
Well, there is a fundamental distinction between overall economic growth and growth per person. And we have been in a number of growth per person recessions, which is why so many of us don't actually feel that we are getting wealthier, even though the economy overall is expanding. So this is where I think uh, we've got to be a little bit more sophisticated than simply looking at something as blunt as overall GDP. Um, look, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of immigration. I think it's hard to be an Australian. We're an immigrant society without being, um, broadly speaking, a supporter of immigration. But that doesn't mean that uh, um, all immigration uh, at any numbers is always a good thing. And, and I totally support Andrew's call in the book for a very substantial um, reduction in the immigration numbers and I also think that um, the problem today is that uh, having got illegal migration under control, legal migration is virtually out of control because so much of it is effectively in the hands of universities uh, who bring in uh, students who one way or another often end up staying for a very, very long time indeed. Uh, and businesses that bring in um, so-called temporary workers uh, who often end up staying for a very, very long time indeed. And look, let me stress, just about every one of them is going to make a fine Australian, uh, but it's not. that doesn't mean that it is necessarily in our interests as people who are already here to constantly ratchet the numbers up and up and up, just so that we keep headline economic growth in positive terms. Paul Kelly, in your book, uh, The March of Patriots, it was published about a decade ago, you have a chapter in there about the, the Australian contract um, on this question of immigration, going back to uh, Ben Chifley and uh, Populate or Perish, and that there was a sense of an agreement there between the elites and the public that if you have border control, you'll boost public confidence for a large scale and since the end of white Australia, a non-discriminatory immigration policy. Haven't we, because Tony mentioned the, the tough, controlled, orderly border control policy, um, why hasn't that boosted public confidence in the large-scale immigration that we've seen in the past? Well, I think it has boosted public confidence. Um, there are two separate issues here. Uh, one but there are growing calls to <coughs> cut it back, though. I, well, let me just go yeah. through this. Though. I think the first point to make is that the... The analysis, if you like, from John Howard back in 2001 is completely correct. Mm -hmm. And that is that if you have effective uh, control of the borders so that the national government is determining who comes to the country in the interests of the country, then this gives the community a sense of confidence about the immigration program. I think that proposition is enduringly Correct. And by the and way, that principle was lacking across much of Europe for the last few decades, correct? Well, well, precisely. And the fact that we're an island continent and an island nation gives us the capacity to have effective border protection. And while there are a lot of, you know, sort of doubts and quibbles in the Labor Party still about this, I think in broad terms there's a bipartisan acceptance now of what you might say was the Howard formula, which was renewed by the Abbott government when the Abbott government came into office and put into effect Operation Sovereign Borders, which was an enormously important and successful uh, decision and initiative from the Abbott government. Now, the second point, uh, though, Tom, is, OK, what is an acceptable level, though, of legal immigration? Now, I'm very pro-immigration. But it is certainly true, as Andrew points out in the book, that the overall level of permanent and temporary migration to this country in recent times has been extraordinary. There's no doubt at all about that. I'm a bit surprised there's not more community resistance uh, to what's happened, um, and we might care to uh, deconstruct that. But I think when it comes to this issue, we need to deconstruct exactly what we try to achieve. Is the problem that we think that there are too many foreign students in the university sector with bad consequences for universities and for teaching? 
Uh, are we concerned about the degree of temporary migration in terms of the workforce? Are we concerned about the overall impact of immigration when it comes to wage levels? And that, uh, that, that is a macro problem to be addressed. I think we need to identify exactly what we see as the problem in terms of the program and then uh, address that problem. Okay, well now's as good a time as to open it up to Q&A and I haven't dealt with the issues of household affordability or federal state relations or the state of higher education, so feel free to weigh into these issues. Questions? Yeah, you, you talk about it. Uh, just one second, I think we've got a microphone. If you, yep, Emily, just over here. One moment, sir. Um, yeah, over here, yep. And uh, please look for me if you'd like to ask a question and we'll make sure we get the mic to you. Yes, sir. Uh, you were talking about um, limiting migration. Um, you didn't mention anything about the infrastructure that's required and the stimulation that that infrastructure would bring to the economy and also the amount of government regulation that prevents um, infrastructure and slows it down. Andrew. Okay, sure. Well, um, on that issue, uh, this, the part of the issue about the stimulus from the infrastructure that's required and so forth is related to this whole debate about per capita growth versus overall growth. So it's certainly true that if you have an extra, an extra roughly 120, 130,000 a year on top of, as I say, that already fastest pace of immigration and you add another 120, 130,000 a year, then you have to build a whole lot more houses and a whole lot more roads and so forth. Even so, it's remarkable that in the dozen years after um, the end of the Howard <coughs> government, when we've had this extremely rapid immigration program, our growth has averaged more than a percentage point, GDP growth, even headline GDP growth has been more than a percentage point below what it was during the period of the Howard government, and per capita growth has been has averaged 0.9% compared to 2.4% per annum under the Howard government. So the flip side is it doesn't appear that, uh, or it appears that you know, there may be all sorts of other things going on in the economy that uh, reduce that. In any case, it's not clear that we necessarily just want to be building more houses and more roads just to get more people and That's a decision people can separately make. Do they, do they want that to be the case? And in particular, to go to your point about the state regulations, because that is an, an important issue, the, the strains that are being placed on the Australian people by our extremely rapid uh, pace of immigration would undoubtedly be somewhat less if it were much easier to build houses and so forth uh, than it is. Nevertheless, that's a debate. I mean, we've had three big housing price booms in the last 35 years or something. We've had this debate about the need for state governments to ease um, zoning processes, land release, and all those sorts of things. We've had that pro debate going on for, for those whole 35 years. Some progress that was made in the five years or so from 2014 or 2013 to about 2018. So we actually did see a big increase in supply for a period, though that's already fading again. But by and large, the point is for three decades, we've had this idea that, oh, we should do something about supply. But the thing is, the issues involved in actually achieving something there are extremely thorny, and that's why state governments have really struggled to deal with that issue. And my take is, it's no good standing on the sidelines and saying, if only we could do something about this, then housing prices wouldn't go, go up as much, and if only we could do something about freeing up the labour market, then wages might not go down much, so and so forth. Uh, the, the fact is, we're unlikely to get anything like the sort of freeing up needed, especially in relation to the housing market, to prevent the massive increase in house prices that we saw between mid-2012 and mid-2017 as a result of these immigration demand pressures on housing. And so if you're not going to get that, you have to say, in this world, what theory of the second best, what can you do to prevent that happening? It's much more important that we try to stop that massive increase in housing prices than it is to say, let's proceed with this enormously rapid immigration. Yeah, following on from that, we'll get to a question in a minute. Tony, um, we commissioned some polling about 18 months ago of millennials in this country. So these are people who were born in the early 80s right through to the late 1990s. And these polls, by the way, reflected trends in the United States and Britain. And something like 60% of young people, we polled a good thousand people through YouGov uh, and Galaxy, they said uh, that they, they, they support socialism and they have contempt for capitalism because of the housing affordability crisis. How would you convince them otherwise? <laughs> Well, you only convince anyone by, I suppose, a, a patient um, advocacy of what you regard as a correct or at least a superior position. And, and um, you know, that's what we have to do. We've just got to do our best uh, to demonstrate that uh, democracy might be gravely imperfect but it's less imperfect but, but than the supply, else. the supply argument you, you've made, Andrew? I've just got to add, I mean, immigration is a great example, though, where you can address, to the extent that's, that, that concern is driven mm -hmm. by the, 
the legitimate fear that lots of young people have, that they just can't get into the housing market, it seems yeah. like they just can't get ahead. Interestingly, immigration is something where you can quite quickly act and mm. quite quickly see results, especially in relation to housing if, prices. Yeah, so if you are adding a uh, if you are adding a city the size of Canberra to your population every two years uh, through immigration alone, the demand for housing is obviously going through the roof and obviously the price of it is going to skyrocket as well. And then you've got the other interest rate issues that Andrew talks about in the book. So. Next question, Phil Wood. Uh, this is a question or an issue addressed to the entire panel. Um, Paul Kelly correctly said that if one wants to introduce uh, significant political initiatives, you need to prosecute the argument in their favour in the public square beforehand. And I would have thought that one issue which is relevant to the discussions tonight and which certainly would be uh, an awkward one on the left-hand side of politics but would tick a lot of boxes, would be the issue which no politician appears to be able to touch of introducing nuclear energy into our energy mix. We are, the, we are the largest uranium reserves country in the world and yet we're the only country in the top 25 economies that does not have a nuclear power program. What do you think about mounting the argument in favour of nuclear power? Um. <laughs> <laughs> well look it's a very good question Phil. Um, to, to, to be honest, to be honest we, we don't need nuclear power uh, because we have an abundance of gas and an abundance of coal uh, and as we're constantly told we've got an abundance of wind and sun and all the rest of it and, and um, currently uh, coal and gas are cheaper forms of baseload power than nuclear um, and of course as we well know uh, solar and wind is very cheap uh, but only when the sun shines and the wind blows and so it's incredibly expensive if you need power that's on all the time. Look, uh, if, if we were going to make an argument for nuclear power in this country, uh, as I suggested in this very room a couple of years ago, I'd go for nuclear powered submarines <laughs> because uh, that is actually uh, something that we also need just as much as baseload power, a strong strategic deterrent. You two want to weigh into this? We can move right along. Well, Paul? I'll make yep. a couple of yep. quick points. Um, if you're going to have a political fight, you need to have a political fight that you can be fairly certain you'll win on. I suspect the coalition side of politics would be fairly divided on the question of nuclear power. Uh, Labor, I imagine, would oppose it. There would be a very substantial time lag uh, involved in the introduction of nuclear power which would raise questions about the necessity of it. And there's a cost factor as well as Tony mentioned. So all I'd say about it is, well, if you're going to have this fight, are you certain you can actually win it? Mm -hmm. And secondly, how important is it? Is it a real priority or not? Mm. Okay, well moving right along. Next question. Yes, I can't see. <coughs> Sophie York and Sophie. a Sorry, Sophie. for Thought the you. whole panel and it's about education. Australian school children are currently taught a skewed defamatory version of our history. They're also taught gender confusion, gender fluidity. They're also made to feel anxious about climate change and whether we're going to fry in a decade. <laughs> they only have so many hours in their school day and in principle we don't necessarily want government to control the curriculum, but someone is controlling it. They only have so many hours to learn and at the moment they're being taught a very, yeah, they're being taught rubbish, thank you. <laughs> yes, um, we've never spent as much money on education and yet the standards are slipping. You do talk a lot about the decline in standards in our universities. Do uh, you want to address that question from Sophie? Uh, sure, well, I, I strongly agree with everything you said and I should say I don't um, focus on this in the book only because School education is primarily a state responsibility uh, and my focus very much in the book is on practical policies for a Commonwealth, for a resolute Commonwealth government, so I don't speak about that. <coughs> Nevertheless, uh, these are critical issues to address and the point I would make is what this always uh, tells you is that what, what matters here is not the speeches that politicians give and so forth, but who is actually controlling, who is actually holding the pen when the curriculum gets written. What is, a, a, I think, a 
constant failure of um, conservative governments around the world, but including in Australia, and I, I think this applies to all conservative governments in, in the recent past, uh, is this notion that you just have to have the battle of ideas a little bit, and you just you make some announcements, and you and you even just make an announcement, or direct, or oh, we'll do this, or we'll have a we'll have a, a reform about that, and then you leave it to the bureaucracy. <laughs> but who are the people who want to have jobs in an education department and want to write curricula? It's all the people with an axe to grind, unfortunately, these days. Now, that, that wasn't true 50 or 60 years ago, but since the long march through the institutions, that is the case now. And so you need a much more active, hands-on process of going in, finding out exactly who the part people are who are writing this, and rooting them out, putting in place your own people, putting in place, getting in place your own panels to do that rewriting, or otherwise you'll just be en ending up in this Groundhog Day where we have the same arguments every five years about isn't it a disgrace what's going on, but nothing ever changes. Yeah, one of the constant laments I get uh, here at CIS from some of our members, Tony, is that there are certain subjects that can't be discussed openly without inspiring massive hysteria. And a lot of this goes back to uh, their education. Um, to what extent do you think conservatives are going backwards in these cultural issues? Well, I don't believe uh, that the left will win because in the end the practical consequences of their positions are totally unacceptable to most reasonable people. Um, I mean, the consequence of an extreme position on climate is um, a catastrophic decline in our standards of living. Uh, the consequences of an extreme leftist position on our history is a surrender of our sovereignty. Um, likewise, uh, an extreme position on cultural relativism uh, is, is an abandonment of any ability to have a, a sensible discussion about anything. So, so look, I, I don't believe that the sort of the extreme Marxist left is going to win, but there is no doubt uh, they're clever at politics. Um, yeah. They know our vulnerabilities and, their, and our weak points. They seek to prey on our decency and our, and our politeness to advance a political agenda. And I guess uh, to quote an even greater book than Andrew's, we've got to have uh, the wisdom of serpents as well as the innocence of doves. <laughs> OK, I'm so sorry. Because it's so crowded, we can't get around, but we will have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, this is, I guess, for the whole panel. Um, Paul Kelly made an important point earlier on about the need to um, not just run an idea up the flag and see how it flies, but to get the discussion going early in the piece. And one of the things that occurs to me is that the coalition have missed the boat a little bit in, in terms of climate change, um, where it's, a, it's sort of like a dichotomy between can we stop global warming or are we going to uh, have reliable and cheap energy? But we need to look at um, uh, climate change in another aspect which is adaptation and, and I think the, the, the coalition should have taken this up a long time ago and developed uh, a narrative that said we've got to do a bit on emissions reduction but the most important thing and I think it may be coming out now in, in the result of um, the fires with Scott Morrison but I'd like to get the views of the panel on, yeah. on, on well, that. On that note, Bjorn Lomberg will be talking a lot about adaptation not just mitigation when he's here and the benefits of adaptation. Direct action was one of your hallmark uh, climate policies, was that adaptation? Uh, well, it did uh, some important things to reduce emissions, uh, but not at the cost of damaging our industries, costing jobs and putting up too much upward pressure on cost of living. So that was an attempt to be practical and realistic. Now, the problem with being practical and realistic is that it's the polar opposite of being theological. And what people want to be honest, on both sides of this argument, is theology. Now, now, I mean, I'm closer to one side of the argument than the other side of the argument, um, but one of the reasons why we don't get, in Australia, the credit that we deserve for actually getting emissions down is because we're not theological about it. We don't say this is the most important issue of our time. We don't say we believe in climate change. We just say uh, climate change is an issue and let's try to deal with it as best we can. Um, but Tony, but that position that you've enunciated... to this thing yeah, as a kind of a religion. But Tony, that position you've articulately enunciated uh, did not go down well in Rohingya. Well, that, and it wouldn't know how... I've just got to say this, because this is a very important issue, getting yeah, back to the, yeah. the, the, the quote of the year last year on the election night. Yeah. How does that position play well with a lot of those metropolitan seats that, that have been safe Liberal seats? I'm thinking of Kuyong, yeah. uh, Goldstein... 
uh, uh, Higgins in Melbourne, your old seat, yeah. uh, North Sydney, Bradfield, Wentworth. How, do, how does that message play and, there? And, and look, if at the end of the day, Warringah had to be lost to win the election, so be it. So be it. And, and uh, the fact is that uh, there have been two climate change elections in this country, the election of 2013 and the election of 2019, and the coalition won both yeah. of them. Well, on that note, let's call on uh, the former Deputy Prime Minister, John Anderson, to deliver the vote of thanks. John Anderson. Mm -hmm. Tom uh, and friends, thank you very much for the opportunity to move a vote of thanks on behalf of a number of people who have been quietly, in various ways, supporting Andrew over the last couple of years while he's brought this magnificent piece of work uh, to the point where it can be launched. Uh, I think it is a valuable contribution to the debate. That debate is a very important one. Unfortunately, you can't get good public policy out of a bad or a truncated or a misinformed debate or one that has deliberately run off the rails. Uh, and indeed I'm reminded, uh, as uh, I think Sophie York asked the question about education, one of our great problems is perhaps neatly summarised by that remarkable American Thomas Sowell, largely retired now, who commented uh, on this matter by observing that the problem with little Johnny is not that he can't think, he can think. The problem with little Johnny is not that he can't feel, he can feel. The problem with little Johnny is he thinks that feeling is thinking. <laughs> <laughs> this is a massive problem for us if we are to restore the capacity to implement good policy. Now you've had demonstrated before you, I think, the ingredients of vigorous debate, of good thinking, of powering over areas where we don't agree. I'd like to particularly say to Tony Abbott that I think you've modelled something in the, your time in the public square and you continue to, which is going to be vitally important for people from the centre right if we're to ever win any debates again. Uh, by the way, old chap, um, I've been a member of the Volunteer Fire Brigade um, <laughs> <laughs> since uh, 1972, I'm told. I didn't know this until I was at our recent AGM uh, out in the bush. Uh, I don't know how many fires I've fought. I have to tell you, I can tell you this, I have just lived through and I'm continuing to live through uh, uh, the worst summer, the worst drought, the worst fire season that I have experienced, but my family on both sides have been in the northwest of New South Wales since the mid 1830s. Uh, my forebears have seen worse droughts and worse fires. And as Churchill once commented, if you want to see into the future, uh, the further you look into the past, the further you'll be able to see into the future, we need to understand history and its lessons. Uh, but one of the vital ingredients that I just wanted to make about an informed debate, I think, is that it will never work without respect and civility. And Tony, your modesty in defeat, uh, your graciousness uh, in tough circumstances, your refusal to take offence even when it's thrown at you is a model to all of us. It's very disarming. We need to remember this. The truth is that the deeper the disagreements, the greater the need for civility. It sounds like a soft virtue. Be nice. Exercise manners. In fact, it's a very tough-minded virtue that says sometimes through gritted teeth, I will not take offence and I will not give it. I will not play the man. I will play the ball. And we have to learn to do that. We have to drag people back to the issues let me make uh, another point in the context of the summer we've been through. I think we could all agree we've seen a massive rise in emotion and feeling as a result of the events that have taken place. They will, I think, push us more towards what I see as the European political trend, perhaps, than the American one. Uh, uh, and that is that the age of populism that's followed the great financial crisis has worried 
uh, commentators and the media massively and they decry it all the time and so forth. In fact, they're probably about to get their way in Europe. You'll see a big swing back to a deep greenism and the dominance that it will have in the parliaments in the years to come uh, when 17-year-olds have the world's leading economists bow before them uh, as great experts. Uh, that will almost certainly produce the perverse outcomes which will exacerbate the problem of intergenerational resentment that's been touched on here tonight. That is to say, you'll see a rise in protectionism, a rise in state intervention in markets. You will see the abandonment of what has presumably passed as some sort of fiscal attempt at fiscal discipline since the GFC. Uh, and that all of that will result probably in the more rapid deindustrialization of Europe than the decarbonisation of Europe uh, and lead to, I think, uh, very unhappy outcomes. We are in danger, I think, of duplicating that here if we cannot force some rationality and common sense into the climate debate. I live at the coalface of the thing. If I thought for a moment the sort of wild promises that we'd heard from the opposition last time, that if we wanted to resolve those climate crises, I'd have voted for them. But I didn't and neither did my neighbours. Australians do understand more, but I must say the centre-right, I think the point made here tonight, let's stand up and actually say what's being done and also start to talk more constructively about adaptation because I'll leave you with a mystery. In farming circles, adaptation is often also mitigation, but we're not even talking about it. You know, much carbon emission is simply linear. Agriculture and land management is cyclical. We use carbon, we emit carbon, we reabsorb it, we reuse it in ways that are quite remarkable and no one's paid anywhere near enough attention to an area where actually this country could be a global leader and agriculture and the quality of our food and its affordability could be improved. Almost no one is talking that language. We need to raise the standard of the debate in that area. Finally, let me leave you with this thought, though. We should value our freedom. We've seen this terrible shift at the hand of the technocrats, hands of the technocrats, over the last 20 or 30 or 40 years in most of the West. The shift from talking about our hallowed freedoms to one of insisting that we all insist on our competitive rights. It's not working. The reality, though, is that we need to shift the debate to something much more serious, which is that in many cases we have very difficult choices confronting us. Sometimes they will involve a judgment about freedoms versus economic outcomes. I'll just leave you with a profound thought, I think, anyway, from Henry Kissinger, that if you lose a little trade, you sacrifice a little prosperity, you can no doubt win it again. But freedom once lost is never recovered. Let us celebrate our freedom. It depends upon a high quality public debate. Andrew, you've made a magnificent contribution to it. Thank you to Paul for your ongoing efforts on behalf of all of us. Uh, I get the Australian uh, electronically ever more, every morning out in the bush so that I can read what Paul's saying. Uh, <laughs> and I say that very sincerely. Uh, Tony, I, I have saluted you for your decency and your lack of front, and I do so again. Tom, thank you to the CIS, because I think, and to you, because I think you've done a tremendous no job, not just of hosting tonight, not just of promoting good debate, but I think in recent times recognising that the CIS's great commitment to good economic policy needs now to recognise in turn that we will never get there without confronting the reality that our greatest problems now are not so much economic policy as the cultural frustrations that prevent us developing and implementing good policy. So it's my great pleasure to say on behalf of us all, I think, thank you very much to these four gentlemen out here. Thank you very much. Thank you, John.